on this episode of the End of Tourism podcast. These things change when our methods of transportation change. Roads go back to the Romans, but in our modern times, the highway, the superhighway, created the suburb, and that destroyed the neighborhood, the downtown. It very much changed the nature of a city, and people who could afford to left. <laughs> And what they left behind was greatly changed by their absence. Because now, anywhere, the suburb has gone digital for a very great portion of people. When COVID shut things down, office shut, and people were forced online. Hybrid work is now the norm and probably will be going forward because it makes sense. So this has changed things again and changed things drastically. For example, if you work from home, you never leave work. That has big social impact on your life, your family's life, and on society. It changes the nature of home and the nature of the office at the same time, simultaneously. Welcome to the End of Tourism podcast, Season 3, Invocations. Our conversations explore the unauthorized histories of modern travel, of wanderlust, exile, and radical hospitality. They are deep dialogues for the dilemmas of our hypermobile times. Full disclosure, dear listeners, the pod relies on a gift economy model in which your donations ensure that this work continues. Without our current Patreon patrons, I simply wouldn't be able to offer this to you. So thank you to each of you who offer your gifts to this project. There are some simple ways to support the pod. You can do so through the End of Tourism's Patreon account at patreon.com slash theendoftourism. Any amount really goes a long way. Now, I've also just launched my new Substack page or newsletter in which you'll receive monthly updates and be able to read all of my archived and new writing on the themes of food, psychedelics, exile, hospitality, and identity, always taking to task the subliminal, mythic, and psychic undercurrents of the culture. Substack will also soon host all of these podcast episodes, so you can sign up for free or on a subscription level basis at chrischristu.substack.com. That's C H R I S C H R I S T O U dot substack.com. Now, stumbling across the pod is often made possible by those ratings based algorithms we love so much. Typically, they're yoked to listener reviews, so please take a moment, it shouldn't take longer than that, to rate or review the pod on whatever platform you're listening to, whether it be Spotify, Apple, or Google Podcasts. It's really, really deeply appreciated and goes a long way. Finally, if there are other creative ways you'd like to assist or participate, whether through post-production, marketing, diffusion, or any other manner, then please feel free to get in touch. My guest today is Andrew McLuhan, an author, educator, and writer who lives in Bloomfield, Ontario, Canada. He is a grandson of Marshall McLuhan, noted Canadian professor from the University of Toronto, who was a pioneer in the field of media and communication studies, as well as the son of Eric McLuhan, who worked closely with Marshall in the second half of his life. Andrew is the director of the McLuhan Institute, founded in 2017 to continue the work begun by Marshall McLuhan and carried on by his son Eric in exploring and understanding culture and technology. He writes and delivers speeches, classes, and workshops on McLuhan methods and work, consults with individuals and companies on understanding McLuhan work in culture and technology, and applying that work today to bring insight and new perception and understanding to the world. I first met Andrew in 2022 at the behest of a dear friend and scholar who told me about Andrew's online course entitled Understanding Media, or the Understanding Media Intensive, which is sponsored by the San Francisco-based organization Gray Area. After spending close to a year studying one of his grandfather's seminal works alongside others online, I felt it would be imperative to have him on the pod and to discuss how, when we think about travel and technology... How the medium is the message. Welcome to the end of tourism, Andrew. I'm so excited to have you on the podcast today. Thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be here. I've been looking forward to this. Mm, me too. Me too. So 
You are, for the benefit of our listeners, the grandson of Marshall McLuhan and the son of Eric McLuhan. Uh, you are a man in a long line of groundbreaking intellectuals and the current director of the McLuhan Institute. For our listeners, Andrew and I formally met through the Gray Area and McLuhan Institute sponsored course, the Understanding Media Intensive, which you currently teach. And I'm wondering if you could offer our listeners a bit of background as to how you came to inherit the McLuhan throne in this way. What drew you to your father and grandfather's work? Perhaps besides the obvious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, the trick to, to answering a question like that is to be brief, because it's a long answer, given that I'm, you know, in my mid 40s at this point, it's a lifelong thing, which is maybe the obvious part, you know, it's a bit of a family affair. It's maybe a little unusual. There aren't a lot of third generations keeping a family tradition going. Often, people lose interest by this point. And to be sure, at younger age, I wasn't very interested at all. It just happened that, you know, I, I don't know what it is because I've been thinking about it and why do I care about any of this stuff? And I think it's the right circumstances, you know, the right distance from the sun, the right amount of moisture, a fertile soil, all these things come together. And here I am. You know, I've always been a poet as long as I can remember. I've loved not only words, but I've taken an active interest in perception and experience, emotions, you know, the secret lives of things, things which maybe people don't stop to think about, but prefer to just get their day going. I like to dwell on those things. And that this McLuhan work has a lot to do with that. A lot of paying attention to things that people overlook a lot of investigation of perception and experience and change. And so the nature versus nurture question is sometimes difficult to attribute one way or the other. I think it's it has to be, or at least it is in my case, probably an equal mix. I mean, I just grew up around this stuff. My dad worked with his father, Marshall, from before I was born. So I grew up around this kind of work and interesting people and, you know, philosophy or deeper questions and encouraged to explore those sides of things. And although I took an interest in my teens, I found it difficult to understand and to approach the work. So I left it alone. Then I tried again in my 20s, and I think it made a bit more sense, but not quite enough to capture my interest. And it was in my mid 30s, you know, about 10 plus years ago now, I suppose, that my dad had an invitation to speak in Poland. And my mom had been going with him on trips because he was a diabetic and he sometimes had, you know, diabetic issues. And you really needed somebody on hand who understood what to do in an emergency situation, especially when there's a language barrier, right? So my mom would go with him to somewhere like Italy or France or, you know, exotic locales. Poland wasn't necessarily high on her list. <laughs> so I didn't have a lot going on. They asked if I wanted to go and I said, sure. And for the first time in my life, you know, what my dad was talking about made real sense to me. Mm. I understood it in a way I hadn't before. And a little bit of understanding goes a long way. It can be an addictive thing, you know, an epiphany is an experience that is unlike any other. There's really nothing to equal it when something clicks and you understand something. It's really a wonderful, a wonderful thing. And it makes you want more. So, you know, the few days I spent in Poland and there and back with my dad kind of broke things open for me. And I'd been working with him since he died in 2018 and just finding ways to get more and more involved since then, I've always been, I guess, a show and tell. Show and tell was my favorite thing at school, you know, and mm. I love sharing my experiences and my knowledge with people. And that just comes naturally to me. I'm also a performer. I used to play in bands and do poetry readings and all the rest of it. And I just, I have a deep and abiding belief in the power of this work and the necessity of it in today's world. And I feel that I'm in a, I don't use the word unique lightly. It really does mean no other. 
you know, mm. distinct, but I believe I am in a distinct position because I'm here in the midst of this legacy and this archive and collection and having the background that I do, which isn't academic, but a regular person, I think I am in a unique position to bring this work to the world in a different kind of way than it has been before, not from an academic, but from a, a lay person's perspective. I really believe that, you know, not to be falsely modest, but I don't think I'm an exceptional intellect or anything. I love words and ideas, but the way I say it is if I can understand any of these things, then anybody else can with a bit of work and a bit of help along the way. And I think that's perhaps what I'm suited to is being a bit of a, a medium between the information in today and tomorrow's audience. So that's perhaps brings us up to the present. So one of the things that I've loved doing is teaching this course on understanding media, which has allowed me to meet people such as yourself and by extension, whoever happens to be listening to this. Mm. Well, you know, definitely an exceptional person and a teacher in regards to the course I've been so blessed to be entered into and to participate in. And despite the obvious aspects of your father and your grandfather's work, this lineage that you've also been entered into, of the real dire importance of their work, it's also a blessing to see a third generation picking up the mantle in a way that is very much an endangered species these days, to say the least. And so, you know, before we dive into things too deeply, which I imagine we probably will, I was wondering, you know, this work that your grandfather pioneered, which today is often referred to as, from what I understand anyways, as media ecology, that he was Marshall McLuhan in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, introducing the world to this philosophy or this study that today has become something available to students in universities and post-secondary education and continuing education. I'm wondering if you could, if it's possible to briefly explain to our listeners what media ecology is and why it might be so important for our time. Sure, I'd be happy to. As with many things, what media ecology is might depend on who you ask. Since you're asking me, I'll give you a particular answer. Marshall wrote this piece with a very clumsy or rather lengthy title, and I think it was 1975, called At the Moment of Sputnik, the World Became a Global Village in Which There Are No Spectators But Only Audience or, or Participants or something like that. I'm mangling it now. But anyway, he wrote that at the moment of Sputnik, when the Russian satellite went up in 1957, he said at that moment, ecology was born. That for the first time, we got an outside-in look at the world, picture of the world, and mm. that changed what the world meant to us. It made it into something that we had different feelings toward, ecological thinking. He said ecology was born and ecological thinking became inevitable. Now, it's funny, he didn't realize this in 1957. He realized this many years later, but that's what he traces the event and the cause and effect too. Media ecology is ecological thinking applied to human innovation. What that means, and although Marshall might not have had the realization for you know more than a decade after, he understood it and, like everybody else, embodied the spirit of it not long after the fact. In fact, less than a year later, in the spring of 1958, Marshall McLuhan first said, the medium is the message. And the medium is the message is an ecological statement as telling you to pay attention to the environment as a cause, as an agent. That's ecological thinking. Well, that's environmental thinking. Where ecology comes into this is ecology suggests intention, I think. Mm. you know. So the conscious curation of the environment or taking care, stewardship, right? And what that means in terms of media or human innovation or technology is understanding the wide range of effects of technology and working to promote the ones you want and mitigate the ones you don't. So 
you can, I said a few years ago, to try and be a little bit provocative, that there's no difference between media studies and environmental science. And if you can use the analogy very well, if you think of our work with technology in the same way you think about our work with the environment and pollution, you know, it's kind of funny. In 1962, Rachel Carson wrote a book called The Silent Spring, Mm. which kind of blew the lid off DDT and the damage that it was causing and got people outraged and, you know, forced a lot of changes led to things like Greenpeace, for example. In 1962 as well, Marshall McLuhan wrote The Gutenberg Galaxy, The Making of Typographic Man, which was all about how the world changed resulting from the printing press, how the world and the people in it. So media ecology and McLuhan work is to take an environmental approach to media. So that is to look at the way that technologies create an environment and how that environment in turn shapes people. And then to take that a step further to suggest that just as we want to be careful about our physical or natural environment and our effect on it, we want to also perhaps be careful about our artificial or human made technological environment and the effects that that has on us in shaping who we are individually, collective socially, politically, you name it. So that's the McLuhan approach to media ecology. And I think Marshall started, well, where the actual term came from is a little bit hazy. There are two major schools of media ecology, if you will. One would be the McLuhan school, which is, as I described, another centers more around New York City and Neil Postman. And uh, He actually taught a program, a media ecology program at NYU, and then at Fordham University, I believe, for many years. And the approach is a little bit different. We'll have to leave it at that for now. And perhaps you should interview somebody from the other media ecology scene to get into how they approach it. Mm, For sure. I'll I'll put it on the list of other media ecology books that I've yet to read. So speaking of this thing that I've been contending with recently, In regards to media ecology, which is what I've heard in the Understanding Media course and in your work and in the work of your grandfather and your father, which is media literacy, essentially to say, well, if we can be conscious or aware of the way that our environments or tools or our technologies are influencing our behavior, then we can also be unaware. We can also be unconscious of those things. And that's generally more often than not the case. So media illiteracy then is kind of what I'm referring to. And in that sense, it seems that a lot of this work around McLuhan work or media ecology is a way of trying to decipher the coded language that our tools or technologies have either within them or the ways in which we use them that we're not quite aware of. And so my first question on this deep dive is, regarding the context of the coded language of social media and what you think the message or the context of that coded language might be? Mm -hmm. Well, the message is always change. So what what are the changes that, that are resulting here? You know, media ecology and media literacy are, I think, complementary approaches, but they're different. Media literacy tends to focus on sort of propaganda studies or persuasion. Somebody is trying to sell you or persuade you of of something for either ideological or commercial ends. So they want you to buy something, whether it's a product or an ideal political message. So it's about influencing and changing behavior right? And the study of that and making you aware of that media literacy generally. And that's obviously very important, especially as means to do so become more and more sophisticated and less and less obvious. Where that diverges from media ecology and maybe McLuhan studies is that what we pay particular attention to is less how people are trying to influence your behavior and more how the technologies are changing you 
existentially because these technologies, aside from what we're using them for, right, and that's the media literacy part, they're affecting us on very fundamental levels through our senses. And everything that we know as human beings comes from the senses, one sense or another, or all of them together. Everything that we know is all information from our senses and then processed and turned into some kind of experience or impression. And I like to use the example of someone who has full working senses and someone who's blind or deaf, right? Mm. And your experience as a blind or a deaf person, to use just these really obvious examples, are much different than if you are fully sighted or have full use of your hearing faculties. Your experience of the world is quite different. The way you're treated and the way you treat other people is quite different. You have different preferences, right? If you can't see, obviously, what do you care about visual art? You don't prioritize these things. You don't value these things. So, you know, this has a lot to do with your values as well. And when you when you change one sense, you change all your senses. You know, you hear about people who are blind or who go blind, and all of a sudden their oral acuity is increased. Their sense of hearing is increase their sense of touch or taste. Other senses tend to pick up the slack and that the balance among them changes. And when that happens, you change. You're a different person. You have different preferences. You have different values. When you get a bunch of those people together, you create a new society, you know? So societal values change. And this this can have huge consequences, and people don't realize that a lot of what they feel nostalgia for is actually who they used to be, and who they used to be is based on a different technological environment, right? The technology in place when the United States was formed, for example, was based on the printing press and the speed of information movement and people movement of the time. That is completely at odds with today right? Where information Mm. travels in the blink of an eye and where you and I don't need to travel anywhere to have this conversation, even Mm. though we're a country apart, the United States being between us. And we don't need to cross that border. We just do it instantly. Mm. This has huge implications, huge implications. None of the values which were created under print conditions can be maintained at the speed of light. Mm. This is media ecology and media literacy doesn't address this so much. So they're complementary, if I think parallel approaches. And in order to create a more full understanding of who we are today, I think both approaches are necessary. Yeah, I've been uh, constantly reminded of Uh, Something that hit me like a lightning bolt when I was reading Gutenberg Galaxy some years ago was that the concentration of the visual sense in Western culture over the last, I mean, maybe 100 years since the television maybe was introduced has increased exponentially. You know, I think something in the realm of 85% maybe is devoted to vision most of the time if we can, you know, reduce it to a percentage and that your grandfather used the term, although I think he was quoting the psychological or psychiatric orthodoxy at the time, but he used the term hypnotized Mm. to describe when one sense overtakes or is, or is, or pushes the other senses out of balance to the degree that they're maybe not important anymore, or just don't have a place in the center of the sense perception. And that really struck me and stuck with me, this notion that through this kind of visual top heaviness of our sense perception culturally, that we're essentially hypnotized beings. Now, I don't know if they use that term anymore, but it's something that I've kind of used to reflect on my use and certainly the general use of the internet, the cell phone, the television, of course, as well, but certainly more so the computer or the cell phone. And yeah, wondering what is it 
that's been either lost or forgotten from the first 10 years of my life when there wasn't necessarily, when I wasn't as hypnotized, perhaps. And that brings me to this other notion of what's been termed as the digital native. The digital native is a person born or brought up during the age of digital technology and therefore familiar with computers and the internet from an early age, which is also to say that they don't have a lived experience or memory of life outside of computers or the internet or digital technology. And so this next question comes to us from a mutual friend of ours, the one and only author and intellectual extraordinaire, Matthew Stillman. Hey. (laughs) And Matthew asks, does being a, quote, digital native translate into any kind or manner of indigeneity? Can the digital native be of a place or are they confined to the perhaps virtual homelessness of the digital age? Mm. Yeah, you know, there's several compelling questions in there. The terminology is interesting, digital native. And the question, does this suggest some kind of indigeneity, right? Which is the suggestion by the language. The thing is, indigenous to where? (laughs) Because the bizarre thing and the metaphysical thing is that uh, Marshall, my grandfather, talked about this a lot. When you're on the phone or you're on the air or you're on the internet or you're on a Zoom call like this, where are you? Because I'm not just here. I'm outside space and time even. Because for somebody who's listening to this tomorrow or 10 years from now or who knows when in the future, I'm there. Or significant parts of me are there, right? So this brings up very interesting questions, which have very real implications, whether or not you want to get philosophical about it. They have experiential implications as to who we are and what it means to be human. These are major changes for what it means to be human if you look at the timeline of humanity spanning hundreds of thousands, millions, whatever years, it's a huge leap. And it's a leap not of evolution, but of technology. But it's no less existential of a change. So that's one part of the question, native to where or when even, you know? I mean, the idea of some immortality conferred by technology is not new of itself. Even going back to to writing, you know, an author, in a sense, their words live on and they live on through their words. Mm -hmm. Even before writing, if it's not directly attributed, oral storytelling continues on people and traditions by passing it along. I suppose this is in that lineage, but to a much, much more of an extreme. But The question of indigeneity, I think, is important, and it has reciprocal, I feel like I'm using a lot of big words here, but I think there's a reciprocal relationship if you use these terms, because what does this mean? How does this change the idea of indigeneity at all for people who are of a place for thousands of years and can claim indigeneity there. It feels to me like a cheapening of that category in a Mm. way. But it's an interesting term because it's a new way to speak of a generation, digital native. I guess we've spoken about the TV generation. So that, that is kind of a precursor, but it's not quite the same flavor as digital native, you know, but you're quite right. It is a huge change. And you and I can remember a time before digital everything where anybody born since the turn of the century anyway can't. And that means something. Um, Again, coming back to who we are sensorily, there are huge changes. You know, to go back a little bit to your question about the message of social media, one of the ways 
Marshall and my father investigated anything, what the message might be in many ways, but but one of the simplest, which anybody can do, is found in the subtitle of one of his well-known works, The Medium is the Massage. And the subtitle of that work is An Inventory of Effects. And this was one of the ways he got to understand it. You know, an environment is a complex and dynamic system, right? It's not something that's easy to, to get a grasp on. Mm-hmm. It's it's big, it's complex, and it's dynamic dynamic in that it's changing, it's shifting, you know? So it's it's tricky to get an overall picture of an environment, but it's not impossible. It helps to make an inventory. Just start describing it. So you want to know what the message is of social media. Well, just look around you in the world today, right? And make an inventory of effects, how people feel, how people behave, values, preferences, industry, education. What is the state of things? Contrast that with the state of things 20 years ago. Okay. And where where have the two come apart? And that's where the change is, you know, what's possible today that wasn't possible yesterday. What's impossible today that was possible yesterday. What new opportunities does this new environment afford and what things does it no longer support and take it forward a little bit. If we keep going this way, what might it look like in 10 years? You know, Mm. of course, that's a very difficult thing to consider because change happens so rapidly now that I'm not sure even digital native (laughs) is an appropriate term for anybody born today. I'm not sure they'll be considered that. Just as Marshall didn't realize at the moment of Sputnik what Sputnik meant, so we won't figure out what today means until a few years from now. It takes a while before we can understand, and usually that understanding comes because we've left it behind and we're in the middle of something else. Mm. So that's a sure sign that we've moved on is when, when understanding comes. And that's, that can be a little bit unsettling. Well, I'm deeply unsettled by what I see as the continued hypnosis, you know, and I'll just give you an example. I was talking to a mutual friend of ours about the podcast and <clears throat> There's this imposition that comes kind of in an auto-generated sense from myself and through the use of social media that, you know, why hasn't this gone viral yet? Or why is it that some posts here and there go viral and the rest kind of fall flat or some of them fall flat and then everything kind of works itself out in the middle. And this friend of ours was suggesting, you know, well, I mean, you could maybe hire a designer, you could upgrade the visual effects of your social media posts. You could do all these things essentially as a way to hack the algorithm, right? And, you know, I was taking these suggestions to heart as possible ways to improve engagement, as they call it. And then realizing that at the end of the day, the end of tourism, my notion of what the end of tourism is or the end of a touristic way of life is a way of undermining and subverting the algorithm right? Not feeding it. And so there's this sense that if I do this, quote unquote, the right way, that I'll be asking people to spend more time on the screen to invite a shorter attention span and more kind of clickbait bullshit in regards to, you know, the way that it's not asking anything of you. So that's kind of the stuckness that I feel. I'm with you. Maybe recognizing that is standing on some kind of threshold between media, between worlds, et cetera. But, you know, it's extremely disheartening at the same time. (laughs) Yeah. Mm. Tell me about it. You have my complete sympathy because I'm in a very similar position. And there are several factors. So there's algorithmic reach and there's organic reach. And it's in a very real way. The question of quantity versus quality, or as our fellow student, dear friend Rena put it, the difference between Kairos and Kronos time. 
right? The measurement of things, quantity versus the quality of things. And I feel the same tension as well, because obviously I believe very strongly in the work that I'm doing and its value for people and it's the necessity of it for today and tomorrow. And so naturally I want to grow it and bring it to the world. And there are ways to do that, but you, you make sacrifices, you know, there are ways to, as you said, hack the algorithm, but I feel like you're hacking people, you know, that leaves a bad taste in my mouth Mm -hmm. Uh, because sure. I have people advising me and, you know, get it on TikTok and whatever else and all these things that you can do. And it leaves a bit of a bad taste in my mouth. I would much rather connect with a small group of people who believe in what I'm doing and are interested and support it than Mm. to do the little tricks and things that give you a broader reach and everything and attract people sure like proven but to what end to what end i think yeah, that's yeah. Interesting. for you, for you it's the end of tourism for myself it's very similar you know if you think about it marshall said that i refuse to sit back and let the juggernaut roll over me mm. Mm. he wanted to end the cycle of what he called somnambulism or sleepwalking you know that we go through through life the not paying attention basically to what we're doing to ourselves when we do this thing called innovation, because mm. there's the ostensible purpose, right? And then there's the actual effect. And there are two very different things often. And we, we consistently fool ourselves into thinking that these ends justify these other effects You know, it's like when you watch, if you watch on television, an ad come up for a drug company and they've got a new drug coming out and you've got these people hand in hand splashing through the surf, or let's say they're splashing through the surf and they're going on a a kite thing and they're horseback riding along the beach and come to sunny Mexico with your family for your all-inclusive resort, right? But what they don't advertise is the real effect of that. And that is the marginalization of communities, the gentrification, Mm. the loss of culture, the change, all these things, these cultural changes that result from hyper-tourism. On the drug side, you have people hand in hand, you know, walking through the heather and living their best lives and God, life has been improved. And in the background is this guy speaking rapid fire, telling you all the horrible stuff that will happen if you actually take this drug. You know, Mm. you're going to have diarrhea and possible internal bleeding and cognitive impairment and all these other things that could happen. You know, all these potential side effects. It's a questionable benefit, you know. And this is the same relationship that we have with our technologies. You know, we see these devices as labor saving or enabling things, but what way of life do they end? What values that we currently treasure are overturned? What values will be creative? Because they're oftentimes at odds with each other. And speaking generically of we, we tend to decry the loss of our values and we do it loudest on Twitter. Mm. And we don't mm. see the disconnect. <laughs> mm. You know? Wow. But there's a very real relationship happening here. And we have no idea. Because we really don't want to know. Mm. Because it suggests responsibility. Mm. And just like when I'm signing up for my all-inclusive trip to Cabo St. Lucas, I don't want to think about the effect on the local economy or local culture. That's not part of the package that I'm interested in. I've got a week off work and damn it, I just want to eat and drink and have a good time with my family and rightly so. But is that the way it should be? 
I don't know, mm. but I understand it because, you know, we've got to live our life. And in order to live our life, we, we have to let things slide. We mm. have to. At this moment, my heart is beating and pumping blood through my body. My hair is growing. My nails are growing. My body is doing all these things vital and necessary to its function that I'm not consciously doing. Because if I sit here and think about it, how am I going to get anything else done? You know, we have to let things slide. We talk about the difference between living in the country and living in the city and how, oh, it's so much friendlier in the country and the city, you're nobody and it's cold. And well, out here in the country where I live, I know a lot of my neighbors and say hi to people on the street, but that's because there's very few of them. If I lived in the city where I have 500,000 neighbors, not, you know, 50 neighbors, I couldn't possibly say hi to all of them. I'd never get anywhere. You know, we have to let things slide in order to function. Mm. Uh, but we do these things, but they're choices. They're choices. And I think if we want to, here I'm being a bit idealistic and lofty, but if we want to have a different world, we have to make different choices. And hand in hand with that, I think we have a lot more agency than people assume. The choices aren't necessarily easy or comfortable. And certainly they're easier and more comfortable for some people. But they are choices, difficult or not. And I think if we want to, and this is a big if, but if we want to take a more active and responsible part in our lives and the lives of people around us, we need to consider the things that we do as choices that we make and whether they're the choices we want to be making. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, uh, Nick. I don't know exactly how we got from, from, from <laughs> there to here, but here we are. Amen. Well, it reminds me a little bit, you know, this, the notion of consequence about your grandfather's notion of amputation and magnification of the senses in the sense of the wheel amplifies the foot, but it amputates the foot. And so I have for our last few questions. A bit of a an avenue towards wondering about travel as as media or as a medium, but in regards to the wheel's power, for example, this this in incredible invention that's moved us and pretty much everything over the course of millennia. In your grandfather's book, Understanding Media, he wrote the following: that quote the transformations of the wheel as expediter of tasks and architect of ever new human relations is far from finished, but its shaping power is waning in the electric age of information. And that fact makes us much more aware of its characteristic form as now tending toward the archaic. So that statement was written and published in the early sixties. And since then there's been a massive massive rise in international travel and tourism in those 60 years. And I'm wondering if you think that statement still resonates with our times, given those changes. Yeah. And it's, it's taken on new meanings as well, because one effect of improvements in transportation, you know, wheel and roads was the creation of the suburb. Mm. Before there were good highways and good vehicles to travel on them before rail, even transportation, you lived and worked in a finite kind of space, walking distance, really maybe riding distance, but generally for most people in a city and an urban area, walking distance, you have to be able to get to work and get home and you don't have a car. You don't have a train. You don't have a plane. You know, that can only be a very limited area. That kept that kept things with a small town feel. Neighborhoods. It kept neighborhoods. It created neighborhoods and very much kept them that way. That 
made for certain social relations. Mm. These things change when our methods of transportation change. With the you know, roads go back to the Romans, straight roads for speed of travel and everything. But in our modern times, the highway, the superhighway created the suburb and that destroyed the neighborhood, the downtown. It very much changed the nature of a city and people who could afford to left (laughs) Mm -hmm. and what they left behind was greatly changed by their absence. Mm -hmm. So the nature of work, the nature of human association changed very much. This has changed again in our time, particularly in the last couple of years with Zoom and telecommuting or whatever. Because now, anywhere, the suburb has gone digital for a very great portion of people. When COVID shut things down, offices shut. And people were forced online. And now, you know, not that COVID is over, but at least the major panic seems to have shifted into a different kind of state. And hybrid work is now the norm and probably will be going forward because it makes it makes sense. Why would you pay for an office building when you only have people coming into it one or two days a week? Now you only need 20% of the capacity you did before. You can juggle people's schedules. People are in business. If you don't need to spend that 80% of your capital on office space, why would you? It makes no sense. So this, this has changed things again and changed things drastically. For example, if you work from home, you never leave work. That has big social impact on your life, your family's life, and on society. It changes the nature of home and the nature of the office at the same time, simultaneously. And it again changes or keeps the road obsolete. Obsolete, not that we no longer have roads or use for them, but the road is no longer in the position it was before. The commute, the daily commute is no longer a thing. It's maybe a once or twice weekly commute. That is very different thing than the daily commute. So again, for us, the wheel and the road don't have the significance they did because now I can visit Oaxaca online and the experience is different, but it's a big change. The road is no longer the determining factor that it was. And this is the nature of technologies. You know, a new way of doing things comes in and it pushes aside the older, the previous way of doing things. Not that it means it dies or disappears, but it changes. And it's a cycle. Now it'll probably shift again before you know it. And keep in mind that this has all happened very, very quickly. And it's all kind of held together by spit and hopes and dreams. Mm. You know, if the internet goes down, it all falls apart. And that's a big if. Yeah. I'm wondering if you're planting seeds there at all. I'm always planting seeds. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that's, it seems a little bit like an Ouroboros or or just contradictory to the extent that one thing cancels the other out. During the pandemic, there was this immense chatter online among people within the tourism industry, sustainable or otherwise, who were talking about forms of virtual tourism as ways of essentially replacing or, or remedying the inability to travel that people could, you know, do a virtual tour of say a museum or a cathedral on their computer. But it wasn't just something that was developed for pandemic times or or times in which people weren't able to travel, but uh, as well for afterwards, essentially understanding that for the critics in regards to sustainability that, well, you know, if either people can't travel, if they don't want to, if they don't feel comfortable anymore because of possibility of disease and 
even beyond that, the consequence of, for example, international air travel that will make virtual tours and they can do this. But at the end of the day, it ends up deepening this relative, we might say, alienation or exile from the neighborhood, from the world, et cetera. And so where to go from there? Of course, it's just the same thing happening over and over again. And so- Tourism is a funny thing. It's a, a mutual cash grab, really, mm. a mutual taking advantage of essentially the area in which I live, Prince Edward County, is has been called Toronto's Hamptons, which is Prince Edward County is to Toronto as the Hamptons are to New York City. And it's not an instant tourism industry here. This area has been a tourist area for a long time, going back a century or more, depending on how you want to look at it. But one thing that's changed, and I'm I'm sure this has changed down there as well, since the pandemic, people not only want to visit here, they want to move here. Because all of a sudden, and maybe this has to do with what we were talking about, people no longer want to live in the city. They want to live out here. And there's a classic overheard a farmer saying this years ago that we have a lot of people are moving in, but we don't have many new neighbors. Wow. Wow. That's a deep thing to say. And Mm. that goes to the heart of what we're talking about when we talk about tourism versus travel. But it's a matter of, of attitude. The tourist, when thought of at their most grotesque, is like a hit and run, you know, throwing money around, looking to extract value while leaving as little of it behind. (laughs) Right. And then in between there, you have the tourist economy or the operators who are trying to extract the value from the tourists and being business people, leaving as little of it behind as possible, not really doing much to enrich the people or the area itself. And this idea of ecology and environmental awareness comes to play here because that kind of extractive or crassly capitalist approach just doesn't hit right anymore. It hits differently, as the kids say today. And I think many people today, if they think about it, don't want to be part of that. You know, that's not who they want to be. They have some sympathy. But at the same time, They also have a week off and they want to relax. So what can they do? What's the solution here? The difficulty with digital tourism is the depth of experience. It's shallow. Mm. While it's wonderful having this conversation, I'd much rather have it there with you. Mm. It's a completely different experience and a much more fulfilling experience to be there. It's uh, a much more fulfilling experience to be in the museum than to take a digital tour, even in VR or something. What is the answer is a very deep question, actually. I think it's a vital question. I think the notion of sustainable tourism is contradiction in terms, right? Because the idea... Mm -hmm of tourism in itself is not sustainable. So what is a different solution? That's an interesting question. I'm not sure I have an answer to, but here's something to think about. Marshall McLuhan got a lot of ideas from Mr. Edgar Allan Poe. Okay. Edgar Allan Poe is credited with inventing the modern detective story, the detective novel. Mm. Not Sir Arthur Conan Doyle with Sherlock Holmes, but Edgar Allan Poe with Dupin. And the archetypal detective and the stereotypical detective story goes like this. There's a body, the scene opens and somebody's died and the detective comes in and has to figure out who done it and how they did it. So they spend the rest of the story, the novel, 
looking for, piecing together clues, and working backwards to find out how this event came to happen, how this mm. murder was caused and by whom. Mm. So Marshall said, we begin with effects and we work back to causes. So what does the end of tourism look like? I think perhaps that's not the aim here. You're not looking for the end of tourism as such, because, you know, the, as they say, nature abhors a vacuum. So you end mm. tourism, then what? Right? Mm. A better approach would be, how can we do this, but better, so that everybody wins, right? So now our objective here is everybody wins. Okay, well, that's a different question. Well, what does everybody wins look like? in this situation. That is where you need to start. And when you figure that out, then it's a matter of working back to, well, how do we get there? But first we have to have a destination. And I think the end of tourism is not the goal, not the destination, but the journey. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I mean... It's a very much an, an open-ended thing that I think desires more than anything to, to wonder deeply about how it came to be this way, right? And mm -hmm. so I think you gave us a little bit of a blueprint for, for how to proceed in that regard. Awesome. I have two final questions, for okay. you, if that's all right. Sure. One of them, I might have to add it out. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to read the question as our good friend Matthew wrote it. No problem. I often enjoy answering questions indirectly or not at all. <laughs> That's the <laughs> prerogative. Okay. So Marshall McLuhan, your grandfather, claimed that the 10 thunders from Finnegan's Wake <laughs> each embody parts of the effects of different technologies or media environments. The third thunder According to Marsha McLuhan, Mark's quote, transport. That's the thunder. The question is, can we attempt to break apart the portmanteau or thunder to see what it might say about the effects of travel. Okay. So this is going back to James Joyce and Finnegan's Wake, from whence the thunders come. And actually, this was something my father did a lot of work on, Marshall as well. But it was my dad that broke open the thunder thing, and he reported on it with his master's thesis. I think Manipian Thunder at Finnegan's Wake, which was published eventually as the role of thunder in Finnegan's Wake. And yeah, the notion here is that in Finnegan's Wake, that unique work of literature, there are these 10 words. Each of them have 100 letters uh, to them. The last one, I think it's the last one, has 101, making up for 1,001 letters an allusion to the Arabian Nights. But the words themselves are an amalgamation. So if thunder number three is about the wheel, these are all words from various languages to do with wheels thrown together. So when you pick them apart, that's what you get. They're not by any means nonsense words. Now, I am not by any means, an expert on the world. I've not made it through cover to cover. I don't think you necessarily have to or supposed to read it cover to cover. If you want to, by all means, do it. And you have my respect. But I haven't managed to do it. I dip in and out as required, usually for the Understanding Media course. Joyce had a very ambitious project there. He described it as a square wheel one wheel all spoke, which is a very much a play on words. If you think about the spokes of a wheel of a tire, 
but then spoke as in recited levels of meaning and interpretation, most of them intentional happening in there. It is a good example of the fact that meaning is manufactured. And there are many ways to interpret things. There are many things happening layered on top of each other at any given moment. And they have literal meanings, they have spiritual meanings, allegorical, anagogical, all sorts of meanings all happening at the same time, and levels within them, depending on how you want to decode them. I have zero idea how far that goes to answering the learned Mr. Stillman's question. I'm sure he'll let me know. (laughs) Amen. Well, thank you, Matthew, for your questions. Thank you always, Mr. Stillman. And to finish up, we have one final question that also comes from a UMI alumni. And this final question comes back a little bit to what you were referring to earlier as the capacity or responsibility to make different decisions, to change our minds, and by virtue of that, perhaps change the worlds we live in. And so it has to do with education. And the question begins in this way. Many would agree that the average person's relative media illiteracy stems from a lack of education. When we approach a new tool or technology, we're typically given instructions on how to use it, but never how it might use us. And so we're left with instruction without much awareness. And this question, finally, comes from Rena a perpetual student and fellow cultural educator. And she writes in to ask, what do you imagine an achieved education would look like in our time? What kind of projects would the McLuhan Institute undertake if, for example, money was of no concern? Hmm. Well, I'm really fortunate and blessed to have such wonderful students. It's great. I don't know what to say about it except to say that I feel very, very grateful. If money were no object, well, for me anyway, McLuhan work isn't so much training in concepts as training in percepts, the training people how to notice things, how to become conscious, because that's the key to empowerment. The key to making different decisions is in enhancing your understanding, enhancing your perception, right? That whole Rumsfeld thing about known knowns and unknown unknowns. And we don't know what we don't know. We don't know what we don't perceive. I'm going to let you in on a little bit of secret about UMI. Understanding Media Intensive, this course that you're taking and others have taken, is a very intentional thing. You know, We're there ostensibly to look at and study this book understanding media. That's the content. Okay. The course to do it is 36 classes long, and they happen once a week in three parts. I'm trying to compress that so it all takes place within one school year, September to June. Currently, it takes about 18 months. So once a week, we get together for three hours or so, and we read, and we discuss, and we explore, and we share But we immerse ourselves in text, in paper and pens and pencils, and in ideas, in dialogue, in talking with each other, in going deeply, in not speed, but in depth. And we do this once a week for a sustained period of time. And the point of this is to change you, to broaden you to widen your faculties, to make you more open to perception and consequently understanding. And that is a supposed side effect of the course, but it's really the primary purpose. If money were no object, I would not have to charge anything for the courses. I really hate Hate's a strong word, which I don't like to use, but I I resent that I have to charge people to take the course. I'd love to do it for free. And honestly, I end up doing it for free for a lot of people because there are scholarships. Do you allow swearing on your podcast? 
Yeah. Personally, fuck a paywall. That's how I feel about it. <laughs> At the same time, I got to heat the place. I got to light the place. I want to build. I want to offer things. And I can't do that without money. I got infrastructure to support and to develop. So I have to make money. It's not really an option. You know, I have a legacy that I've somehow taken on and I now feel responsible for its continuance. Nobody forced that on me. I took it on myself, but it's incumbent upon me to figure it out. So, dear listener, (laughs) if you're out there, you can support my work by signing up for Understanding Media Intensive if you want to, if you care to through grayarea.org or I actually have a Patreon page. I've got like 50 people on my Patreon page and most of them honestly are in there for a dollar a month, (laughs) which is great. The fact that there are 50 people out there that pay anything a month to help me is amazing. It means a lot, but it doesn't fix the furnace that I had to fix last week and it doesn't do a lot of things. So I'm about to revamp the page because uh, it's that same tension, which we were talking about of quantity over quality and feeding the algorithm. Because Mm -hmm. if I want to make this thing sustainable, I've got to have a, a greater reach than I currently do. And at the same time, if I have a greater reach, I can't have the same relationship with people that I currently do. So there's sacrifices and choices that I'm having to make, but I'm not independently wealthy. I inherited a great intellectual tradition, but I didn't inherit the estate to support it. So that's where we are. And yeah, if you care to support what I'm doing, I appreciate it. Well, I'll make sure that all of those links to the Patreon and okay. the McLuhan Institute and Understanding Media via Gray Area is up on the End of Tourism website. You also have a Substack, is that correct? Oh, right. I have that too. <laughs> I have a Substack. So the idea with my Substack is that I kind of wanted to resurrect something called the Distant Early Warning Newsletter, the Dew Line Newsletter, which uh, Marshall put out in the late 60s. And I wanted to do something similar. And the idea was to do a hybrid digital physical thing because the heart and soul of what I do is rooted in accessibility, making this work accessible in terms of being available, but accessible in terms of, you know, like I said, with as few barriers as possible, financial or intellectual. So I wanted to do a digital version that anybody could access for free. And I wanted to do a physical version, a mail out that would be by paid subscription and something that people would like to to have and to hang on to, and that would support it. However, I've been unable to find a partner to make that happen. Basically, it's like, well, get back to us when you have a few million followers. And it's like, okay, Mm. when I have a few million followers, I won't be needing to get back to you. But (laughs) anyway, right? (laughs) It's like. So I've got that sub stack and, oh shoot, what is it even called right now? I believe it's mcluhan.substack.com. Thank you very much. So what I'm going to do is I'm aiming to do a monthly newsletter, which is really going to be kind of a roundup of interesting McLuhan stuff with commentary for myself to bridge it from yesterday to today and make it useful. That's basically the pitch. In the meantime, you can subscribe to it. And when I when I turn the monetize button on, you'll be able to pay for it as well. Mm, Amazing. Perfect. Yeah, I'll make sure all those links are available in the homework section of this episode for for our listeners. Thanks, Chris. It's a, a great honor, and the world is deeply indebted and deepened by virtue of your work and your willingness to see that work into the world so stop (laughs) hey it's true i wouldn't lie i appreciate it Mm. thank you so much for joining us today and uh, have a beautiful beautiful day there in prince edward county 
Thank you very much, Chris. My best to you and everybody listening. Thank you for listening to the End of Tourism podcast. If what you heard had its way with you, if the arrows hit their mark, click subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you're listening. To go deeper, join us at theendoftourism.com and follow us on social media under the handle The End of Tourism.